Final Fantasy XV released in November 2016. It featured a very troubled and protracted development. Initially planned to be released as directly part of the 13 games to be titled Versus 13 and releasing on the PS3. Eventually, it would need a severe change in management and production, resulting in an unfinished game with a noticeable chunk of it needing to be provided via DLC. To the point that it is a nice easy go-to for those games that enter development hull lists. This is all common knowledge to pretty much anyone with a surface level understanding of gaming culture. So why am I just starting the video like this? Well, it's because there is something different here to what I have normally been doing recently. For the past two videos in this series, I have started with a reference to something seemingly completely unrelated and then tangentially linked it later in the video. But I won't be doing that this time. And that is for the simple reason that I've kind of already given my opinion via the title. But I would ask you to indulge me here. Because I do think I can add an angle to this. 15 is the only game in the Fabula Nova Castalis collection that I played before starting with these videos. In fact, I actually platinumed it. So, I can give an opinion as someone completely cut off from the series and also now someone looking at it in the light of the series it was supposed to be attached to and the zeitgeist around the franchise at the time. I also only played the base game without any of the DLC. So this serves as an opportunity to look at that base game alone, released in 2016, and then the whole collective experience intended together. But first, as per usual, just some of the core matters regardless of base or DLC, starting with the first thing you need to look at. Well then, by all means. Last thing I need now. Eyes peeled, mouth closed. This is probably going to be a pretty short segment purely because the combat is functional. I remember there being a pretty big stink throughout the development with this one finally being the mainline game to throw off any kind of turn-based or ATB battle system. A fuss which still continues on and will until the heat death of the universe. And as I've said, it is functional. There's nothing really wrong with it, but it's definitely not special. And I won't even use the defense of, well, it was the first one and it would be improved on later. Because while I definitely agree, it has been improved on, real time action combat was already done in the Fabula series with Type Zero back in 2011, and I would say Type Zero did it better. But again, it is functional, and I never really got tired of it. Well, there was one reason I did, we'll get onto that later. How it works is that you are only in control of Noctis as your party leader, as has been kind of de rigueur for the Fabulous series. You hold down circle to get Noctis to auto attack, while moving the analog in different directions to adjust how he attacks. For defensive purposes, you hold down square 
at which point Noctus will auto-dodge attacks. Well, I say hold down, but the first time I played, it was after I played 7 Remake. So I was very much in the mindset to press square for each dodge attempt. Which was actually a good thing, because while you can just rotate between holding down square and circle, it does pay to be a bit more discerning. Dodging uses up MP, and if your MP drains, Noctus will enter stasis, which leaves him very vulnerable. So, obviously, the desire to not waste MP would serve as a good encouragement to be more measured with the button. But there is also the parry mechanic. On occasions, when an enemy attacks, an icon may appear, at which point you can hold down square to block. But you can't have just been holding down square before the icon appears. If you block successfully, then you will have the opportunity to counter, which deals a lot of extra damage, and also may knock the enemy over and place them in a vulnerable state. Tied to this is the interactions with your allies. If one of your AI servants is close to Noctus, you can activate a link strike. This can either be done by parrying, at which point they will join in on your counter, or alternatively, if you attack an enemy from behind, they can join in with a blind side link. On both occasions, it just does more damage than Noctus would do alone. Yes, if I may. The third interaction is the cross chain, a feature added in patch 1.13. If you incapacitate an enemy, the party can then go hog wild on it. By timing the pushing of circle, each member can get 10 hits on and do heavy damage. Lastly, Noctus has the ability to warp short distances by pressing triangle. This can obviously be used for quickly moving out of a tight spot, especially when Noctus has been hoid right and proper, but it is also used offensively. You can warp strike enemies, which is one of the best ways to incapacitate an enemy and you can also warp two warp points, which will automatically restore MP and allow a vantage point for a bit of health restoration before warp striking back into battle. Gotcha. So, that is the core combat, and honestly, it is better than I remember. I started writing the script before having started the game again, doing it based off of my memory of my first playthrough, and I forgot some of the nuances which actually make it better. It does unfortunately become a tad repetitive, mostly due to something we'll get to, and it does feature another problem that will be talked about later as well. Let's quickly though talk about how a few other areas are handled. I really liked the idea and attempt behind what they were trying to achieve with the magic in 15. 
Instead of the characters being able to intuitively cast magic, it is held in containers that are used like kind of arcane grenades. And to have these ready to use, you need to craft them. To craft them, you use ingredients gained from battle and found from foraging out in the world. You can then begin building. First, you need to choose your element between fire, ice, and lightning. Obviously, you have enemies weak to specific elements, but they also have their own added effects. Lightning and fire do lingering damage, while ice slows enemies down. After the initial impact, they also have lingering effects on the terrain, like burning grass, meaning that you can still maybe run through the flames while battling. And then, depending on the environment, they may also be enhanced, such as lightning being enhanced in rainy weather, for example. After choosing the element, you can then use ingredients to amplify the magic, some which make it more potent, others increasing the number of times it's cast, and even additional status effects attached to it, like poison and stop. So, it's set up very well, and the effects when used look great. But I just feel like its potential wasn't realised. I specifically didn't really find motivation to use them, or perhaps more accurately, I felt a bit disincentivized to use them. While it is very effective at destroying weaker enemies, you can generally just get through those battles without the magic. Especially given the effort it would take to refill all the vials you may have used. So, of course you could argue, then just use it for stronger enemies and bosses. But then there is the problem that it doesn't feel extremely effective against stronger enemies. Not helped by the fact that it hits your allies as well. I mean, that does make sense given that you're nuking a small part of Aos, but Particularly in boss fights, where you are sometimes going to be doing more damage to your party than the actual enemy, it does feel like a bit of a disincentive. That being said, if you are willing to pump all of your elemental power and items into one spell, it can do a ridiculous amount of damage. That's it! What's up, Iggy? I've come up with a new recipe. But then of course comes the problem of now having to gather all the necessary stuff to start making again. So I would say best use for fights in which there are a lot of enemies. So to sum it up, I really like the idea and it can be fun to use, but unfortunately there are flaws in its implementation which prevent it from being great. It's specifically hurt by a problem which I will be getting into later. For now, let's talk about another combat related mixed bag. I genuinely think that summon implementation has been flawed since the last time it was done while in 10. That is the last time I will bring up 10 in this video, since I know it's triggering to some people. But I have generally not bothered to really use summons 
as much in later games. I will say I haven't played 12, so I won't say it is an issue there since I don't know. But in Type 0, I never equipped summons, rather using the Vermilion Bird or Trio attack abilities. I didn't really like to use them in 13, as I've explained, and 13.2 didn't even have them. I did use them in 15 and 7 Remake though, but that's because they only show up once and don't really drain any MP or technique points, so why not use them? And I do think there has been a gradual improvement from 15. I like 7 Remake's way, but I just don't think it's as good as it was done before, and 15 is better than 13 and Type 0. It's just like with the magic though, there are flaws, specifically two in this case, which make me much more lukewarm about the feature. In this case, it really is a situation of a game creating high expectations in this regard, which it doesn't live up to. The Astrals are quite key to the plot of 15, like major plot lines are about getting their blessing to assist you in defeating the baddies. And I just feel that when you make something that heavily linked with your plot, they need to be done very well. And they are done very well in terms of damage to be fair. They do do a lot of damage. Generally being able to wipe out most weaker enemies in one hit. And also, in terms of the animation, the cutscenes do look good. The issue really actually comes from the lack of control you have over their summoning. The summon attacks for 15 have reverted back to how they were during classic Final Fantasy, in that they appear, do a big animated boom boom, and then leave on their merry way. But the difference is that you don't just get to call them when you want at the cost of mana. They show up when they feel like it. And when I say that, there's literally a hidden random dice roll with higher chances of them appearing after each round. So, sometimes you have a pretty tough battle that you just have to deal with, and then other times, removal show up to help you beat up the neighbor's dog. The other problem related to this is their lack of diversity. There are only six summons in the game, with only five of them actually joining you. And you don't get to pick which one you want to use. Again, it is random which one appears, with some of them being less likely than others, them requiring specific conditions to be able to be more likely to show up. This is even further muddied by the fact that you only get Leviathan after Chapter 9 and Shiva after Chapter 12, and Bahamut only shows up in a plot battle, and you can't summon at all during Chapters 9 to 13 which means you have to rely on the randomizer to maybe let you see them in chapter 14 or else that's it for them for the game. Unless you go back to the past or whatever. As a result, I actually never saw Shiva or Leviathan in battle on my two times of playing and I only saw Titan once. And even Ramu didn't appear that much for me, well, because of my fault I suppose. No, actually no, it was a design choice and it's not my fault that I chose to do the extra content given to me. There is a quest you can do as a crossover event with Final Fantasy XIV, a really cool quest actually, and by completing it you get Garuda as a summon. And from that point on, every time I summoned, it was bloody Garuda 
who appeared. So, while the summoning has some good ideas behind it, there are annoying flaws which prevent it from being fully enjoyed. I see a bit of a theme developing here. Could crash right here. You can remain awake long enough to eat. With this feature, and another one we will be getting into later, you can really see the influence that Western companies started to have from the collaboration that began in 13.2. 15 features a two-pronged leveling system. There is of course the standard XP, which increases stats, but there's also the Ascension Grid. Similarly to past games, you get AP points, but it is now used in a more Western sandbox kind of way, where they are used to buy skill points, which improve link abilities, Noctis' combat abilities, or give bonuses to exploration, and more. But it's not just the Ascension Grid which has this Western influence. It's also in the standard XP leveling system. In an Elder Scrolls-esque kind of way, 15 has decided to include game-breaking bugs. No, it hasn't. The game was perfectly stable for two playthroughs now. Apart from Ignis seeming to be suffering from something, and Gladio deciding he doesn't feel like fighting. But what it does have is the situation where you can't just level up. All XP accrued from quests and combat is stored and only doled out upon resting, at which point it is bestowed upon the party. But by how much? Depending on where you rest, you get an XP multiplier, which means more leveling up, obviously. You can also use items and eat food, which improve how much XP you gain. More on this later. So, that covers the most notable aspects on the combat, but before moving on, there is something that I want to talk about, and it's been a long time coming. This is something that has bugged me throughout the Fabulous series, but I've not thought it to be so much of a problem, so I haven't talked about it. But it does keep coming up, so I feel like I can't really ignore it. Ironically, I don't think 15 is as bad as its predecessors here, but it does still feature the problem. And that problem is, enemies in this series just have too much health. It is all good and well that you can stagger enemies and do ridiculously new levels of damage, not like that seen before in the franchise. But when doing 10,000 damage is the equivalent of doing 100 damage because the enemy has a million health, it's not really changing the dynamic. I really don't see the point of just making the numbers bigger if it is effectively the same as before. Sometimes battles just become tediously long and can often lead to frustration when you give up 20 to 30 minutes only for a small slip up or some unfortunate timing creating a game over. 
And this is the point where the combat is undermined. Because long battles start to make the combat a bit too repetitive. You will just keep hitting and try and continuously move behind for blindside attacks. And then wait for opportunities to counter. And this is why I probably still put Type Zero's combat ahead, because while it also had its fair share of just chipping away, the combat does have a more action RPG nature, making those tedious battles a little bit less tedious. And related to this, on the subject of recurring throughout these games, So we'll just stay out of it. It's mm, cool. Let's go. All kidding aside, I hate you. Whoa! What is that? Oh, oh no! Yeah. Wait, dude! That's a turtle! The Adamantois has been in the franchise since Final Fantasy 2, and it's always been a bit meaty and an irritation, but there is something going on under the guise of Etro which has created these annoying bastards. In all four of the games I have discussed, the Adamantois has been transformed into the para-reptile Ubermensch, wandering the plains and asserting its dominance over all beneath them. They are the meatiest bastards around, but not just that, they also possess the ability to basically wipe out the party with one attack, and so possibly rendering 20 plus minutes of work undone. It's probably the worst in 13 though. In Type 0, it's really only required as part of one mission. And to complete the mission, you don't actually have to defeat it. In 13 2, there's only one to serve as like an extra boss hunt. And it's weaker, with a lot less HP. And in 15, it's supposed to be a super boss, which in the base game is only fightable after the game is over. However, with 13, it's slightly different. Firstly, let me acknowledge that you can just ignore them for 13 as well, but it is kind of annoying to just ignore a standard enemy that is on the map because that's what they are in 13 while they are obviously stronger than other things in the area they are still a standard enemy on the map and you want to beat those at least once or twice and then when you get far enough with the hunts they get even stronger now i understand it is just for completion sake but they are just bloody tortoises. What prompted this idea to make them so broken all of a sudden? Was someone at the company attacked by a turtle? I can't imagine what would make bloody turtles so outright disgusting. I mean, it's just a thing in a shell. I don't understand. What is going on? I've always found it funny when I hear people speak about Final Fantasy XV as the first open world Final Fantasy. I mean, this is the franchise that already in the first game had the airship for going around the map. But I get it, it was the first, and only so far, 
which had the open world as we know it from the more western related point of view. You are plopped into the world from the off and given full view of the map. Go explore. If you want a bit more information of where to go, stop at the diners and get some points of interest. And from the aspect of making a big sandbox for shenanigans, it is there. But it's one thing to have the sandbox. The other is for it to actually be an enjoyable one. So is it? Let's look at some factors for determining this. about this let's start with the more superficial one superficial but definitely with an important role is your open world interesting to look through as you move through it now Obviously, the actual graphical design helps with this, but so does variation. It is important that your open world remains interesting and unique as you move through it. It becomes more demotivating to continue traveling when you are pretty sure that location E will still look the same as A, B, C and D. Now, obviously, this is also affected by the size of the map. I feel smaller maps can get a bit more leeway with not being as varied, just because it doesn't take too long to get through them. Though you could also argue, if it's smaller, you can give more focus on making it more diverse. Anyway, Let's look at how 15 performs, firstly in the design aspect. 15 used real world locations as the template to create fantasy style versions of them. And the game looks really nice. I said in my 13 video that I found its design to be better as it was more interesting and unique. And I still believe that. But I still really do like 15's world, and I think it has some genuinely beautiful locations. Moving on to the variety, because that's the segment after all, and that is also good. There is a fair variety of locations that importantly also keep consistent with the general locale, and also transition between these areas well. We have our more touristy tropical beaches, rocky beaches, sandy plains, marshes, grassy plains, woodlands, a volcano, and the culmination of the game before things start to go downhill, the Venetian city. But more on that later. So I do believe that 15 nails the aesthetic aspect required for the open world. But that is not all. Obviously. How do we move through these pretty visuals? Hit it.
How do we move through the world? That is quite important. So, how do we? Well, the main means of travel is of course the car. And honestly, I have mixed feelings about it. On the one positive side, it is pretty unique, especially for the series. Not only that, but it is easy to navigate and it gives you a good view of the world in terms of just catching the sights, but also learning the layout of the land. And it also ties in perfectly to one of the key ideas of the plot, which we will obviously get more into later, but the idea of going on a road trip is very well emulated. I for one spent many hours driving about listening to past game soundtracks. However, now on to the negative side. It does feel very railroady. Well, since you are stuck to the roads, and it becomes tedious after doing it for an extended period of time. Also, for the longer distances, the car just doesn't move fast enough. I get it for the road trip vibe, but again, after doing it for a while, some urgency would be appreciated. But of course, you don't just have the car, you can get out of the car and stretch your legs to move yourself to a chocobo and stretch its legs. Yes, you can, and it's done very well. They have good maneuverability and cover ground pretty quickly, allowing for effective and thorough off-the-road coverage. They can also be leveled up to be able to jump higher, move faster, have more stamina, help with party regeneration, and even assist in battle. They can also be customized. You can pick the color of each party member Shockabo, which is just a fun little detail. There is something a bit unsettling about just callously dyeing them different colors, but shut up, they're pretty. Lastly, we have the airship. I don't like it. It's like just there. You take off from the road and then get to fly about. But in order to land, you also have to land on the road again. So you are a bit limited with where you go with it. But the biggest problem is that you only get it after the game, at which point there isn't really anywhere to go in particular anyway. And given how much effort it takes to get the airship, it really doesn't feel worth it. I do however like the Regalia Type D, the off-road vehicle. It gives you so much more freedom being able to go off-road and the test drive courses, while not difficult, are quite fun. I do also want to quickly add that there is actually a noticeable difference in the feel when traveling via the different means. Like you can actually feel the difference when traveling by foot, car and chocobo in terms of how fast you move and how quickly the ground is covered. So that's now the means of travel but it doesn't really matter if there is competent transport if there isn't really anywhere to actually go to. It's fish, like a kid in a toy shop. Yes. If you want to have an open world, you need to have things to do in it. And 15 mostly passes this test. 
Firstly, we have side quests. Quite a lot of them, in fact. Unfortunately, they are largely just fetch quests, or go kill something without too much fanfare. But there are some that are much better written and actually have something more to them, like the Hunt for Deadeye, which also featured a bit of variation in gameplay, adding some stealth, as did one of Dino's quests. It wasn't the most mind-blowing thing, but it's nice to have a bit of variation to the core gameplay if it doesn't overstay its welcome. Unfortunately though, they are few and far between. Again, mostly being go to a place and do a thing. However, they do give you experience and also can serve as a nice way to introduce some mechanics and features, as well as helping you with learning the layout of the land. And there are a fair few which are about taking photos, which can give a nice break in combat. We've reached a creature crossing. Wow. Where do you think they're all going? We could always follow them and find out. Tying in with the concept of traveling around to twat things are the hunts. Essentially just the marks from 13. You get tasked with going out to murder the riffraff bothering the denizens of Aeos. After doing enough, you will raise your hunter level and can then do the more difficult hunts. So yeah, the marks from 13. But at least we do have confirmation now that Noctis is a chaser. But again, they do give experience and rewards in terms of restorative items and they can actually be quite challenging, serving as a good test of how much you have mastered the combat. The more inconsequential ones include the ability to partake in chocobo races, the fishing minigame, which I've seen get dunked on quite a lot, but honestly I liked it. As someone who has played many Japanese games, and therefore many fishing minigames, it is one of those that I enjoyed the most. It's not too overly complicated, but it also does provide enough challenge that you are still kept stimulated rather than just staring until needing to push a button. I found it to be quite calm and meditative, which fishing is supposed to be as far as I know. Anyway, the chocobo races are literally just that. You ride the chocobo as you would normally on the world map, but now it's in a race. You can also run around and pick up various items strewn around the map as they are shown on the map. Not the most thrilling of things I realize, but you can do it. Lastly, I don't know if this really counts because I think there's like three or four in the entire game, but at one point they do add Imperial outposts that you can attack. And I kind of wish there was more of them. I actually did enjoy it. However, I actually need to correct myself on something I said earlier. These smaller side activities aren't actually that inconsequential. Because what 15 does do well in its open world design is that it achieves This is not 100% a definite requirement that all sandbox and open world games have to have. There is nothing wrong with side activities that exist purely for the reason of taking a break from the core loop. 
completely segregated from the rest of the game. But it is nice when some effort is made that it will have some interaction. And 15 achieves this pretty well. By doing objectives that get assigned to you in battle, you can earn AP points for the ascension grid, from which you can then get the ability to garner AP from fishing, traveling in the car, traveling on a chocobo, chocobo racing, taking photos, so many various things which will then allow you to get AP points faster and so allow for unlocking the abilities which can then improve your character's combat capability. In conjunction with AP and combat capability, we also have... That's it! What's what? I've come up with a new recipe. You can stop off at the various eateries as you drive through Aos, where you can eat food, which gives temporary stats boosts. But better than that, you can get one of Noctis's peons to do the cooking for you. Every time you set up camp at one of the havens on the map, you can select a meal for Ignis to make. Each offering different stats boosts to last an amount of time after resting. This time can be improved via the ascension grid. You can also cook one of the party members favorite dish, which improves their chances of getting a critical hit and also benefits a combat feature I neglected to mention in the combat section. Techniques. As you fight in battle, the technique bar will fill. When enough bars are filled, you can do a technique, with each member having their own technique. They can learn additional techniques through the ascension grid that can be swapped out. They can also be leveled up just by using them. And if the character has the boost from their favorite meal, they will level it up faster, making it more effective. The third type of leveling that takes place at the campsites is for each party member's unique skill. When they use their skill throughout the time between resting, it will also gain experience, which will then level it up to improve that skill's effectiveness. Noctis improves his fishing skill, which unlocks discounts on bait and other items, which makes fishing easier. Therefore, gaining more AP, ingredients for cooking, or items that can be used in C. Ignis's is cooking, obviously, and he learns more recipes as he levels up. Promptos is photography, which just unlocks more filters, so doesn't have much gameplay impact, but is obviously great if you wish to take photos. And lastly, Gladio has the survival ability. He has a chance of scavenging items after battle, with better items being obtained at higher levels. And this is a very good skill, especially for a combat reason, which again, I neglected to mention earlier. It is great that he can acquire healing items, because this might be the most I've ever used them in any Final Fantasy. Apart from some techniques, there isn't a dedicated way of healing without the use of potions. I mean, health does slowly regenerate, and you can point warp to take time for that, but in a frenetic battle, 
that isn't exactly effective or efficient. And it's also only healing Noctis. You can also imbue magic to heal its caster, but again, that is only targeting one person. So the most effective way of healing is by using curatives. And I really like that. I have already complained before about how progressively through the series the effectiveness of items was neutered, so all I will say is it's nice for them to be useful again. Helped even more by streamlining the potions to be heals half health or full health, which means they don't become useless as the party gets stronger. So, camping has some good benefits, and we haven't even got to its role in characterization and exposition yet. But it's just a cog in what for me was a mostly well-crafted open world that interacts and has side activities that benefit gameplay and aren't just isolated. Though I do say mostly for a reason. And that is because there is one wart sitting on all of this. Let's regain our focus. This is not plot pacing, though that will be a problem spoken about later, but explorative pacing. I'm not sure if that's an actual term, but basically 15 doesn't do a good job of leading you into its world slowly, allowing you to get to grips with an area before moving on. It does do this in the first two chapters, when you can only move around in the lower half of the map. In fact, it's actually annoyingly constraining you, since Ignis won't let you drive the bloody car. Hey Ignis, how's it feel being away from the wheel? Positively frightening. What are you saying? That I'm no stranger to His Highness's driving habits. You know what Ignis? I'm actually getting very tired of your condescending behaviour. But after that, it opens up to basically the rest of the map, and you are left just to travel it. Now the road trip vibe and general beauty of the game does help to push exploration, but after long enough, it doesn't serve as enough of a motivator. For me, one of the main issues is that the core quest line doesn't really help facilitate the exploration either. One of the things that JRPGs have historically done pretty well is getting you to find the majority of the locations in their games. Not all of them. Obviously there are those who reward the keen explorer but about 90% of them will generally be found. And they do this through the main storyline. By following through with the main story, you travel through most of the locations throughout the game. Either there will be something done for the main plot at that location specifically, or it will be something you pass on the main plot, being very unlikely to miss it. Now, you are likely not going to be able to do everything at the location the first time, but you now know it's there, and it may leave a few clues for you as to things that can be done when you come back later. Now, obviously, with 15 having the car being the main form of travel, you are going to pass a number of locations. 
but there will also be a few you won't ever need to get near. Ones where you will deliberately have to veer from the main path to go to through your own desire to explore. The most unfortunate victim of this being the volcano, which for me is one of the more interesting locations and has one of the most fun hunts. One they actually build up to from like 30 minutes into the game. I realize that this is very plainly leaving me being open to being accused of being a brainless moron that needs to be continuously directed to every location. And fine, make that criticism. It's not like I haven't had that before. But it does somewhat hurt the interconnectivity I've genuinely been positive about. It also feeds into an issue which has honestly been around in Final Fantasy for yonks. The incongruity between side content and main plot stuff in terms of difficulty. Often, the side content will be quite difficult and so need a lot of leveling to be able to do it. But then, the main content is too easy. I think I have a pretty good example with this one main questline here. Just before you reach the end of the dungeon, you have a boss fight with a creature called Naga, which is like a snake woman. And it feels like it should be pretty challenging. I mean, there is dialogue before the fight, and her presence is even teased earlier in the dungeon, with all these sounds just coming from somewhere, and Prompto even disappearing at a point. But because I had spent a lot of time beforehand gathering turnips, the fight was, well... Oh, no. I know this is a pretty common RPG problem generally to be fair, so I maybe shouldn't attack the game for it, but still. I realize that 15 does have recommended levels associated with its quests, so you could argue follow that as a guide. But for me, only doing quests of your level is actually more restrictive than asking for the plot to open up new pathways for you. It will also lead you into another problem. Quite a few of the main quests are lower level than the side quests, and much lower than a lot of the hunts. So you will be gating yourself off from side content for a good while, and that will cause a big problem if you hold off stuff for too long and go to a specific point in the main quest, for reasons to be discussed later. However, in the interest of fairness, I should say there are a few side quests that do encourage you to go visit other locations. But the side quests also do exacerbate the problem a bit as well. Firstly, while there are a lot of quests, there aren't too many quest givers. There's about 10 people in the game who give you quests. So, that's already a bit boring just seeing the same faces over and over again. But what adds to the tedium is that as I said earlier, they are often very fetch questy. Go do the thing and come back. Compounded further by the need to travel. The locations the quest need you to go on are quite often a bit out of the way 
and distanced from other quests. So, if you have a lot of quests on you, which there is a good chance you will, especially when reaching the Stalem, the quest givers are quite clustered together, there isn't really a kind of path you can follow to pick up the majority of them along the way. So it really does become quite back and forth, which is obviously very tedious. So that's the gameplay, something which I'm largely positive on, despite that little diatribe at the end. Let's stay on the positive side for a bit longer as we move on to... But you need to realize just what you mean to the boys by your side. I do. Even if they can't solve your problems, you can't hide what's going on from them. It hurts like hell. Remember, those ain't your bodyguards. They're your brothers. Fifteen really does nail the interactions between the main cast. The chemistry between Prompto, Ignis, Gladio and Noctis feels really natural and believable. You really do get the feeling that these are people who have been friends for a long time. And what makes the display of their dynamics even better is that it is not just restricted to cutscenes or story beats. These relationships and interactions are displayed through gameplay. Firstly, you have the general casual dialogue that they engage in while driving, exploring dungeons, and just generally traveling around the world. Secondly, and probably most interestingly, is via combat. Through the use of the techniques and the link strikes, we get a subtle, but at the same time, detailed view of the synchronicity between our four friends. We even get some nice emphasis of this from a tie-in side quest in the game. In an event for Terror Wars, or battle, one of the two, Noctis gets sucked into an alternate world where he meets Sarah from said terror game. For the first part of the quest, attempts at link strikes tend to fail as they aren't coordinated with each other, with it improving throughout the course of the quest. And while this is also just a little bit of fun, playing with expectations in isolation after you have been linking away throughout the game, and now you can't, it does also emphasize the relationship between the party. And what these link strikes also do is that they don't just show the sync between the team, but they also give a bit of insight into their general fighting style. Gladio goes more for brute force and thuggery, Ignis shows style and finesse, while Prompto is frenetic and over-eager. <laughs> but combat isn't the only gameplay means of this illustration. The camping contributes greatly to this as well. Firstly, before the actual camping part, you can train at the campsite, starting with just Gladio, two Gladio and Ignis, Gladio and Prompto, and then all three. This has the advantage of providing AP, but it also goes into further sharing the bond formation between the foursome. That's very minor, obviously. The camping itself does do more though. Obviously, there is the background that shows while accumulating XP, 
which shows them interacting, giving a glimpse of what they do when they camp. But more importantly, is what can happen after resting. The tours. After resting at certain places, you will be assaulted by one of your crew who will then encourage you to do something with them, which will provide for more interaction and also a bit of gameplay variation. Racing with Gladio, helping Ignis cook, flower picking with Gladio, a heart to heart with Prompto. While it's small things obviously, it is a nice bit of extra interaction and I really do like the dynamics and chemistry amongst our main party. However, there is a downside to this. Well, two negatives actually, but we'll only talk about one later. While the characters are an interesting dynamic, individually that isn't as much the case. Like, their personalities seem to be predominantly based around how they interact with each other. You know those couples where they are terrified of being apart from each other because by themselves they are completely vacuous people? It's a bit like that. I mean they aren't that bad. They do get glimpses of independent personality, but it's not really enough. And this seems specifically apparent with our non-main characters. Not to sound like a beta SJW, but it's specifically bad with the female characters. I vaguely remember there being some people upset that the entire party was male, but that doesn't really bother me that much. Final Fantasy has pretty much always had prominent and capable female characters. So the choice to do a brosive road trip is perfectly fine with me. But it doesn't really help when the women you do have are presented as uninteresting or stereotypical. For example, Iris is really just there to be the doting little sister who has a crush on our clueless protagonist. And then we also have Cindy, who to be fair is strong and independent, but I kind of feel like she's a bit of that stereotype of the strong and independent, and also a bit too sexualized woman character. And when they aren't stereotyping, they are sidelining, as is present with... Hey, pretty boy. <laughs> Let's see what you can do. Not just a female character, but a character in general who had the potential to really flesh out an interesting person. Firstly, I just really like her boss fight. It actually feels like you're fighting against another trained fighter confident in their skills and who actually reacts to you. Probably helped by the fact that she actually has a move set since she becomes an ally AI later. But beside from that, she feels like one of the few characters who actually has a personality not determined by other people around her. Though it does sometimes veer into the realm of being the stereotypical self-interested mercenary character. And then she also just pisses off after we're done with her. So, it kind of just makes it feel like she's filling in because we don't have Gladio with us. But that's something to discuss later. But, it would have been great to see more of her. I specifically would have appreciated seeing her more for a few boss fights, 
rather than the continuous appearances of someone else. A bit like the Turks in Final Fantasy VII. However, what we are going to discuss now is the biggest affront to a character in this game. It is such a shame what happened here. Luna has glimpses of such a great character. By her resolve, her compassion, the obligations that tear at her, and just her desire to live a life. But as I said, there's the problem. They are glimpses. Her appearances never divulge or examine enough. Instead, very much creating the possibility of you finding the character a bit uninteresting on a first playthrough. As I kind of did on my first time, much to my shame. In my defense though, the story isn't helping when one of her few appearances is her swanning about just being oh so pious over the peasants. I will say though, there is one cutscene with her that I really like, but we will be speaking about her in more detail later. It is in receiving mercy that men offer praise, and in shedding grace that the gods solicit worship. I do think that I should stress that this uninteresting and bland personality plight is present in pretty much all the male characters as well. Yo, brace yourself for power. I don't think it was some kind of malicious plot to specifically just make the woman look bad. I'm just specifically mentioning Iris, Cindy and Luna because they are supposed to have very strong links with the main characters or are very important in the plot so you would expect them to be more interesting. In fact, one of the most important characters is uninteresting and male. Fancy meeting you here! It occurs to me I never formally introduced myself. Izunia! Arden Izunia! Imperial Chancellor Izunia! At your service, and more importantly, to your aid! I really don't like this attempt at a villain. Yes, he is the villain, and no, I don't think that needs any kind of spoiler warning. It's pretty obvious from his first appearance, like an hour and a half into the game. And he just for me, comes across as that cliché attempt at making an interesting villain. You can see the goal was to make him kind of eccentric but charming, who despite his malice and evil, you can't help but feel enraptured by him. But instead, he just ended up being a posh British dude. The kind of one who would go to public school before ending up as the home secretary after the next cabinet reshuffle. Though, he probably isn't evil enough to be a Tory. And as a result of this, he actually ends up having the level of charisma that could make him the new Labour leader. And to add to this issue, I struggle to see what his motivation is. Yes, my favourite bugaboo. You spend the vast majority of the game having no idea why he's doing what he does. Now, it isn't imperative that you know the villain's motivation 
throughout the game. Especially for Arden's case here, I think it would ruin a fair bit of the tension and mystery and the reveal. But if you are going to do that, you need them to be compelling and I just can't see it. I don't find them interesting or sinister or threatening. And even when we do get this motivation revealed to us, some of the stuff that he has done to get here doesn't seem to have been very necessary in retrospect. So, we have hit a point of negativity. It is now time to take the plunge. And so, we arrive where the problems are going to start. When I was playing through again, I was a bit confused as to why I had this overarching negative opinion of the game. But then I played longer, and I remembered. So, let's jump along to highlight the issues. Obviously big spoilers from this point on. I don't really have much of an issue with the first two chapters. I really like the intro, how it does a fake out from starting with this grand opening, but then just cutting to the car being broken down. It's a good joke on its own intro, but also the big openings that the series is famous for. And the choice to cancel going to the wedding because the kingdom was attacked is fair enough as is the need to collect the royal weapons in order to reclaim the kingdom. There is also some good showing of the conflict of Noctis attempting to come to terms with his father's death, while simultaneously needing to focus on the obligations of being the new king, which up until now was just an abstract concept for him. Unfortunately, this will also serve as the point where we will start to encounter our first problem, as the plot pacing now begins to start some trouble. It's very strongly hinted that a large part of the game is going to be dedicated to this quest for the weapons. But no, we are basically done with it now. There is only one more mainline quest which requires you to collect the royal arms. The rest left for you to do of your own desires. And it's not even done out of an express goal of finding it. After working with Kor to break the blockade, Gladio is contacted by his sister Iris. So they head to Lestalen to meet up with her. Once arriving, Jokers over here tells the party about a story of a weapon behind a waterfall, and so they decide, oh well, we may as well go then. And then upon returning, we're done with that, and now it's time to introduce the summons. So, off to Titan for the first trial. And I do have to say that while I believe the boss fights are too simplistic in gameplay terms, I really do like how they do exposition. For example, in the Titan Trial, you see a Noctus who isn't really comfortable with his powers. He spends the majority of the trial attempting to run away, and then when forced to fight, he's constantly on the defensive. I also like this conversation with Gladio, when Noctus keeps complaining as they are trying to make their way out. Gladio becomes noticeably annoyed and basically craps him out. It's a good interaction showing that this journey is taking its toll on everyone and that not everything is about Noctis. Those around him also have duties and responsibilities that weigh on them. So we are getting some nice characterization 
through the fighting. But it's now time for a double whammy of the two core plot problems in 15. Firstly, one which we will see more of later. When we return to Lestalem, the party are told that Jared, one of the royal servants, was killed in an attack. And it's a bit difficult for us to get involved with this. We see Jared in like one cutscene. So, while we can understand the impact it has on the party on a basic empathy level, we don't really know much about him to feel too much. And then, shortly afterwards, pacing issues in another direction as the party must leave to Altissia. Almost as if they realize that this acceleration of what the plot is about may rush things a tad, they then decide to introduce some padding. On the way to Cape Chiam, the party attacks an Imperial fort as a revenge strike, which is fine as a little breakup in a long car journey, and it also has a natural means of introducing a new character. But it's made to look worse after reaching Cape Chiam. Oh no, the ship to Altitia won't work unless we get the magic MacGuffin that will require us to go through another dungeon to obtain it. This will also serve as an opportunity to do one of the two appearances of the character we just introduced and make her seem like she has some interesting aspects before we throw her away. Now let's go help the Lestalem power plant so we can reintroduce Gladio because he disappeared for a bit. Oh, and also get a new NPC to give us tedious side quests to do. Look where you're going! Didn't mean to do that. Yeah. What's your problem? How about you cut it out before someone gets hurt? But it is now time to arrive at Altissia. First and foremost, I love this arrival seat. It looks really great and does justice to the build up it takes to get there and the comments made before leaving. Unfortunately, we won't be here very long because even if we include side activities, there isn't too much to do here. Noctis negotiates matters around the summoning of Leviathan and it's time for shit to get real. This is an amazing moment, definitely visually but also narratively. Leviathan shows great resistance to bestowing her blessing upon Noctis, basically thinking he's a punk ass bitch. And she has reason to. So far, Noctis hasn't really shown that much conviction in what he's doing. Seemingly just going along with all of this due to a sense of obligation that has been instilled by his role which is a bit understandable to be fair. We see this in the first part of the fight, Noctis basically flailing around in an attempt to get a hit in, as the player needs to keep point warping just to keep in the fight. But then we get the decisive moment, Luna's death, and her using her last strength to summon the power of the past kings. And it is in this moment that he accepts his heritage and the role that he occupies and starts to master what he is capable of. It is all set up so well, but then almost immediately starts to undermine itself. Would that I could join you. But this moment will have to be enough. It's not right. All I... All I wanted was to save you. When the world falls down around you and hope is lost, 
when you find yourself alone amid a lightless place. Look to the distance. Know that I am there. And that I watch over you always. Farewell, dear Noctix. This scene is obviously visually amazing. Perhaps one of the best CGI scenes in the series for me. And it really hits you in that moment. Initially. What this scene is attempting to emphasize is how much Noctis needed Luna. Emotionally and in terms of the duties he must fulfill. The moment of him as a child juxtaposed to her as an adult, quite clearly depicting his immaturity and inability to cope without her as a crutch and support. However, there is one problem here. If you take yourself away from the emotions and heaviness of that moment, which definitely gets you in that moment, Afterwards, you start to question. And the simple reason for that is we barely got any insight into their actual relationship. Apart from the message exchanges via Umbra, which serve for a few flashbacks, we didn't really see any interactions with them. It is difficult to create the level of empathy and feeling of weight intended to stick with you here when you have very little actual knowledge of the dynamic between the two. Not helped by one or two indications from Noctis that he isn't overtly into the whole thing. Like he doesn't really seem that excited to go to her at the beginning of the game. And then we have talked that the wedding is like just arranged for convenience. I do understand that it is more just part of his character that he is kind of apathetic and disinterested. But when you already have got to see so little of their relationship, it's a bit of a risk to make one part of it seem pretty uninterested. I do want to quickly say that I do like the one flashback which shows them together as kids where Luna tells Noctis what the Oracle does and how they are tied to the Kings and the Astrals. I think it does a very good job of showing the role and burden placed on the Oracle. A situation where already as a child they have to have such an intimate knowledge of what they do and accept what their life will be. That they have to be the foundation for governance while the king gets to be a bit of a gormless fool who doesn't know anything, at least as a child. It would have been nice to see more of that and perhaps even more of how this weighs on her. And this issue of lack of context then bleeds onto what happens next when we discover Ignis is now blind for some reason and then we jump to them on a train where everyone is annoyed and miserable with each other. Something that is understandable given the tribulations they have had to deal with but it also has the same problem. For me Gladio just ends up looking like a bit of a dick for getting annoyed with Noctis for feeling sorry for himself. Like, his fiance has just died, after his father was killed, and he now has to go on this massive quest to get the kingdom back. Meanwhile, we haven't really seen too many sacrifices that have had to be made by the other party members. Like Gladio alluded to it at one point, 
and Ignis is now blind, and I'm sure it was in service of Noctis, but these aren't things we see happen, so it makes it harder to sympathize. Meanwhile, we see everything that Noctis has had to deal with. And this is actually a point where all the bonding stuff I was positive about creates a bit of a problem. It only showed positive interactions. So that sets you up for a bit of a lurch when we have a twist in these interactions. However, we are still getting some good characterization at this point, with Ignis and his discomfort eventually bursting into anger as he feels himself used as a scapegoat for everyone's general frustration. And we have some pretty good ratcheting up of the tension in the plot, as Noctis' confusion knocks Prompto off the train. And we get to see Leviathan, because I sure as hell wasn't going to ever be able to summon her. No, not you. The party arrives at Tenebrae, and oh look, it's Oranea. Oh, we're done with her again. But before we leave, we get a bit more insight into Luna's final moments, which is just there to annoy us with more missed opportunities. And then Shiva decides it's probably time for you to know what's going on, and while it's nice to have this, it feels like we're getting the Cliff Notes version because we're running out of time. But it's now time to crash at the capital for the worst part of the game. Noctis can't use his weapons and so is forced to put on the Ring of Lucis. And this part fails gameplay wise and narratively. Firstly, the gameplay is just tedious. Just walking around and holding circle to death everything in the way or occasionally triangle to suck everything into the vortex. So it's not even challenging. They tell you to hide occasionally, but that really isn't needed. Apparently, before they patched it, the death didn't do as much damage, but that doesn't add challenge. It just makes it more tedious. And it's so long. But it's also bad narratively. You are running around disintegrating everything and then you have Arden smarming over you, insulting you about how weak you are. Fucker, I'm exploding your army with basically my mind and you are taunting me about how helpless I am. You really are helpless without your friends babysitting you. And what's really annoying is that this could have actually been done really well. You could have had like 15 minutes of actually being helpless, needing to sneak around and hide. And if you are seen by an enemy, you would have to run away. And then in a moment when Noctis is truly in danger, has nowhere else to go, he can then put the ring on something which we've clearly shown him have reluctance to. And then you can have just five minutes of nerfing everything. Then we go on to discover that Arden is actually a member of the Lucis line and was a healer during the time of the Great Scourge. But he was betrayed by the king and now seeks to destroy the whole bloodline and the crystal. Which is a perfectly fair motivation. Nothing else to say on that. Noctis communes with Bahamut and is told he must sacrifice himself to destroy the Scourge. And he returns to the world in which demons have taken complete control. And I really like how they show the demons taking control. Just being a common roadside sight as you drive back to Hammerhead. 
like you would see them on a game drive or something. Too bad the rest of the chapter is pretty bloody disappointing. There's so little going on here. It's just running through the streets and then fighting Ifrit. Which to be fair, is a pretty damn cool boss fight. Unfortunately a bit too easy when you're on level 80 though. And then you move on to Arden, which is just so uninteresting and boring for the final fight of the game. And that's it. The final chapter. It feels like there should have been so much other content here, but let's talk about the ending. It did hit me quite hard, and left me feeling pondersome for the rest of the evening upon reaching it. Seeing Noctis have to leave his friends behind and sacrifice himself does round off everything well. And the post credit scene of them having the last camp together reinforces the brotherhood that the core plot was about. And the chance for Noctis and Luna to finally reunite is a sweet moment. So, I'm ending this segment on the plot on a pretty positive note. But then why did I talk about this being the negative part? Apart from the pretty tedious dross of chapter 13 and the disappointment of 14, I didn't really have anything that made me immediately negative. I really enjoyed my time, especially everything up till chapter 10. But it was a case of build up. Over time, little niggling annoyances piled up. The side quests are not well thought out. The traveling becomes too tedious. The pacing is poor here. Characters are not getting fleshed out enough. Those who seem to be interesting are not given enough screen time. Until we hit the final chapter, and that lack of a real final dungeon served as the tipping point to leave me with a general negativity that blocked me from remembering how much enjoyment I got from it. And it's so frustrating because so much good is done, especially story-wise. It hits those right beats so well when doing its Final Fantasy moments. Moments that when you experience them, you get such a feeling. I can perfectly understand why people talk about scenes that they say left them in tears. But it didn't stay with me, not something I would remember long afterwards. A lack of context or poor pacing which didn't allow that moment to stay with me long term, as I've experienced with other pieces of media. Luna for me stays a sticking point. Firstly, she is just generally a badass girl boss, but she's also just such an interesting character. Someone torn by duty and obligation, but also a yearning and desire for things that provide her with her own happiness and self-realization. And it's just such a shame we didn't see more of her, especially since it damages Noctis's characterization as well. Again, it is hard to get as involved in their relationship as we don't see the moments which are supposed to have formed that bond. I get that they are supposed to have tragically been forced apart by the current situation, but just some more moments. Again though, this is one issue which wouldn't have been enough to severely worsen my opinion if it wasn't for all the other small little warts which pop up to nip away at my positivity. However, on the second playthrough, 
I was more positive. And that was because... Firstly, just a quick run through of some of the additional gameplay content that came with the patches and the Royal Edition. I already spoke about cross chains, which are fine, but I do feel like its implementation is a bit clunky. Sometimes when an enemy is vulnerable, the chance to do it triggers, but other times it doesn't. Sometimes it will be against the most standard of enemies, and then it doesn't show up during tougher enemies, and only once per battle. I get that it can do a lot of damage, so they don't want you to be able to abuse it, but why not just make it for boss fights then? Or some other criteria to be able to do it? I also already mentioned the Regalia Type D, but I really do like it. It's fun to drive, and it allows you to cut across country with ease, and also, It does have a bit of the Mako physics from Mass Effect, but I do like it, and I like the test courses. Though, I do wish there was more of them. On the vein of transportation, I also like the boat. It's nice to have a means of going back from Multisio, and riding on the ocean is relaxing and looks really nice. It also adds to a more interconnected feeling with the world at large. Also, as someone who actually likes the fishing mini game, it was nice to have another quest related to it. But the big thing to talk about here is the revised final chapter. It is such a great improvement. Firstly, it's just more interesting to also have an underground to run through rather than just running around the streets. Secondly, there is also other stuff to do, making it feel like an actual final dungeon. Though the quests you are given suffer from the same issue of being uninteresting. We get the extra boss fight with Cerberus, which is just pretty fun, and then we get a cool cutscene with all the astrals, which feels like a good culmination of all the work done to commune with them. It does slightly impact the summoning of Bahamut in the Infrit fight, as that is no longer his first appearance, but it is also nice to see him more than once. And the fights against the old kings do a great job narratively. Firstly, with each one placing one of the party members and how they play in their DLC front and center, and so further emphasizing the importance everyone had on the journey, but also because it forms as a confirmation that Noctis is the king of kings. He has surpassed the kings of old, and so is the one to banish the scourge. The Arden fight still sucks though, so let's break out of the confines of the core game and stretch out to broader horizons. Released in July, as they headed to the game's release, King's Glaive shows the events building up to and during the Niflheim attack on Insomnia, which is heard about at the beginning of the game. I'll be honest here, and say that I put off watching for a very long time, 
like two years of having it and I hoped that finally watching it would lead to me realizing I was missing out on something really great. That didn't happen. Kingsglaive is just fine. It is of course visually amazing with some shots if looked at with a quick glance actually being mistakable for live action but I don't really give Square Enix points for that anymore. What I'm more concerned about is plot and that's quite a mixed bag. As someone who played the game first it's nice to have an explanation of how Luna got the ring and also why it is so important. Since the ring isn't even spoken about in the game but then the plot suddenly becomes completely revolved around it. And I suppose a bit more background of the kingdoms isn't a bad thing but also I didn't really feel like I needed it to know so much detail. There was a war and a failed ceasefire. That was enough information for me to play the game. But for me, the worst part was the whole xenophobic aspect of the plot. I did like the idea. The notion of an army made up of immigrants who fight for another nation which view them as dispensable. That maybe this kingdom isn't as wonderful and brilliant as they present themselves to be. But then it goes and undermines itself by basically saying these people are wrong and must just shut up. I mean, they start the film by telling us the Empire is so evil and bad, while Lucis is brilliant and lovely and grand and wonderful. They then take it even further by having those who opposed the king's decision gullibly believe the empire and then like almost instantly get their comeuppance. Basically saying, duh, of course the king is right and smart, you tool. How dare you ever question that an unelected authority might not always be concerned about your needs. But I also feel like there was a missed opportunity. King's Glaive has a lot of combat, especially around the end where it actually became a bit wearisome to watch. So I feel like instead of making it a film, they could have actually made it a playable prologue. They could have done something like Metal Gear Solid did with Ground Zeroes. Something that gives you a taste and some familiarity with the new mechanics and systems and then lays out some basic story groundwork for you to go into the full game with. I feel more people would have wanted to interact with that than a movie. But overall, we just got a pretty standard and fine film. Released with pre-orders of the game, and then for free to regular scum later on, A King's Tale is premised around King Regis telling Clay Noctis bedtime stories. However, Noctis finds his stories to be reductive and stilted in their examinations of the human condition. As a result, Regis is forced to come up with his own story and tells the adventures of him and his old compatriots through the form of a beat-em-up. First and foremost, the graphics. Some standard good-looking pixel art. It looks good and fits well for the choice to make a beat-em-up game. The intro reminds me of Shadowcaster, which is a champion game, so of course it's great. On to the combat, and it is perfectly serviceable. Square for light attack, triangle for heavy attack, and circle to stun attack. You can combine these attacks together to smack them in the air and do other combos. If you chain enough attacks together, you will be able to call in one of your allies to do an assist, and if you chain even more, you can do the armager. 
with it being more powerful if each of your allies was used first. You also have access to magic, with the three elements present in 15. And the longer you hold it down, the more damage it will do. And as I said, it is perfectly serviceable. I'm not a massive beat em up fan, though I have played the best one ever that will never be surpassed, but I feel King's Tale mostly does the job. Effort has been made to have it so that different mechanics are used for different enemies. Heavy attacks needed for Ronin, stun needed for skeletons, you can deflect needles, you can knock bombs into other enemies, you need to use magic for flan. But ultimately, it does become repetitive, and while you can do combos, you will most likely just end up button mashing. Though fortunately, it is also pretty short, so it doesn't feel like it's starting to drag ever. If we take a look at it for its story and lore aspects, there really isn't too much to it. The fact that it is left ambiguous as to whether it's actually a true story or not means that you aren't really able to take the interactions between Regis and his friends at face value. Not that it really matters, since it doesn't really tell you anything about them anyway. There's just no interactions between them. However, it does show more how close Noctis and his father are, and does help with giving more light to how heavy a loss it was in the plot. On a much more positive note, as a Final Fantasy VI obsessive, it was great to see Ultros again. Overall, not much to it, and I wouldn't really recommend it unless you really did like 15. But I mean, it is free, and only takes like an hour and a half. The first episode to be released, and possibly the most half-hearted, at least story-wise. Following his inability to best Ravis, Gladio has gone with Kor to face the Blademaster, with the aim to improve his combat capability and worth as the King's shield. And that's it for the story. There's really nothing else to it. We get a bit of background to Kor, though I don't really know if I needed that if I'm honest. And we also get some more insight into Gladio's own fears, and anxiety that he actually isn't good enough to be the King's shield, and that his inadequacies would be responsible for the King's death. This being reinforced by the fact that his own father didn't even trust himself to fight the Blade Master, and so possibly not be good enough to guard the King. And this is a good reveal, which gives him a new dynamic, and does actually provide some understanding to his aggression and frustration towards Noctis when they are in moments of danger. Though, I don't think even the strongest of shields would be able to protect the king when I'm controlling him. However, there isn't too much other characterization or story additions. And personally, I'm just not a massive fan of the character telling his story at the campfire means of storytelling. But that is obviously just a me thing. It does, however, have some gameplay variation. Episode Gladio veers the game more towards hack and slash, with the combat being more about attempting to chain attacks together and quickly respond to enemy attacks. 
as per the normal game, you hold circle to attack and square to defend. But the defending is slightly different. Holding square will bring out the shield rather than initiate auto dodging. And you can just block the attacks. But there are some incentives not to just hold square. Firstly, strong enemies will occasionally glow red, which means that their attack cannot be blocked and so forcing you to dodge instead. Secondly, if you time the block to just before the enemy strikes, you will then get the chance to parry that attack. And you know, I said hack and slash, but for me, especially with the one-on-one -on -one fights, it started to feel a bit dark soulsy. However, that might just be because my instincts from playing Bloodborne kicked in and I just started dodge rolling and parrying immediately. The other thing related to dodging and twatting things is Gladio's two meters. The first one slowly builds up with each attack and as it does, it will upgrade what kind of heavy attack he will do upon pushing triangle. The other is the rage meter, which will not rise if you get hit, but the higher it goes, the more damage Gladio will do when he attacks. So you basically get a one hour dungeon to smash around in, but there are two small issues I have with the combat. Firstly, when you are attempting to move around quickly and so are holding down the analog stick, the pushing of square sometimes confuses blocking with dodging and so you can miss parry opportunities. The other relates to the third combat thing. You can pick up broken columns to swing around and smash with. The issue is that there is no pause or protection while lifting it up. So you can quite easily get ganked when there are a lot of enemies around. The situations where you would most like to use a column. But overall, a decent extra one hour of playtime that doesn't add too much plot wise. On to number two, and I was actually surprised by how much I enjoyed this one. Honestly, off the base game alone, I found Prompto to be really annoying. So I was kind of dreading playing this one, but it gives a very sympathetic and compassionate view of the character. But before getting into that, gameplay. I really like how these episodes are introducing variations to the core game's gameplay. It makes it feel like it's actually that character's story, rather than let's see what Noctis's serfs get up to when he's not around. In Prompto's case, it plays like a stealth third person shooter. Caution, the enemy is approaching. Caution, the enemy is approaching. Caution. The enemy is approaching. Caution. You can shoot your revolver, which has unlimited ammo, but you can also find extra weapons lying around, like rocket launchers, SMGs, and sniper rifles. If you do enough damage to an enemy, you can make them vulnerable, which allows for a lot of damage through a crack shot or melee overkill. After the initial area, there is then the combinations with Aranea. Oh yeah, Aranea is back for a bit again. It works similar to the link strikes and techniques in the original. But it's a bit weird here. There isn't clear text that you have actually initiated a link strike. And it doesn't require her to be close to you either. Sometimes she just appears out of nowhere and joins in, and will even knock you over in her bloodlust. 
Anyway, on to the story part. After being knocked off the train, Prompto ends up in a Magitech facility and Arden attempts to remind him that he's initially from Niflheim, the twist that we discovered at the end of chapter 13, and prompts him to go find his creator. He escapes the facility and then goes on to help Aranea destroy a secret Magitech weapon before leaving to reunite with the party. That is a very quick run through of events, which makes for a pretty generic plot, but the core is the character moments within. There is a very good examination of the confusion and dissociation that Prompto feels having been created with the goal of being a weapon to destroy the people who he befriended. The strife that comes with having found a group of people who provided him with a sense of belonging when he felt completely alone, and now having that fear of losing them when they find out about his background. The flashback of him when younger is missing a fair bit of context and doesn't explain much for those who didn't engage with another piece of media and it also doesn't explain how Prompto gets captured in the way you find him in the base game. But as a commentary and inspection of how your birth and heritage does not determine who you are, it is good and the episode is enjoyable. But there are two things I'm quite negative about. The first one being, the final boss is boring as bollocks. It's literally just firing a turret non-stop. And secondly, Aranea has nothing added to her. Maybe I was wrong, and she is just a boring individual. But I see there is a theory that it isn't actually her and that it's really Arden who's creating an illusion. A theory which does have some credibility to it. So that might explain why she is such a dullard. Speaking of which, The last DLC to be released after the remaining scheduled ones were cancelled. This one left me with mixed feelings. But before we get onto the point of contrast, let's discuss the point where I have no ambiguity. The gameplay for this episode is perfectly fine. The combat is similar to the base game but with the ability to demonify vulnerable enemies serving as the means of charging Arden's version of the Armager. He also has the ability to shoot across the map very quickly by teleporting to different elevated points. It's a very prototype actually. It's also nice to be able to play with Ifrit and actually have control over my summon. I also like how gameplay contributes narratively. Arden's means of combat being quite similar to Noctis, noting their blood relation. But it's also slightly different, highlighting Arden's perversion from the Lucis lineage. The major deviations taking place later in the plot after he starts to embrace his demonic influence. It's subtle and done very well. But onto the plot aspects and uh, I thought I wasn't going to find the further delving into his motivations very interesting, since I didn't really have an issue 
with his motivation in the base game. I just thought he was a bit of a ponce. But being provided the insight of what he lost and how he suffered, it gave such a good fleshing out of how he became warped and distorted that the sinister aura that I didn't pick up from him originally is now there. Also, the reveal of his relationship with the first oracle and her being the ancestor of Luna not only makes this moment make sense but it actually makes it a bit haunting. In this moment, Arden has a reflection of what he used to have and who he used to be, but he then rejects it. In a confirmation that he is now fully gone. All good characterization, but what of the further explanation of the plot? So, Basically, Arden was originally meant to be the first king of the Lucian kingdom. But because his ability to heal slowly corrupted him, the gods and his brother decided he must be usurped. Therefore, he is imprisoned before being freed by the Empire and then embarks on his quest for revenge. However, before he is able to slay Regis, Bahamut intervenes and makes an arrangement that Arden must bring darkness to the world, to serve as the catalyst for the ascension of the Chosen King, Noctis, to come and completely cleanse the world, which would then allow him to finally end the curse of his immortality. And... Uh... It does do a good job of explaining Arden's seeming willingness to help Noctis along the way. But it does also make me a bit negative about the overarching plot. This is going to be extremely subjective. As is everything I say, obviously. But I'm really not a fan of prophecy plots. That's not to say they are always bad. Interesting things can actually be done with it, especially if you attempt to subvert it. But even if playing it straight, you can still punctuate it with good character moments and interactions, which 15 does do to be fair. But when talking about the plot in the immediate, I can struggle to get into it. It takes away a fair bit of tension when you know that everything is prearranged and should work out. Made even worse here with the reveal that the villain is also in on it. That being said, I do like the ambiguity we get at the end. The fact that Arden is now so twisted that we can't tell whether he's actually planning on going along with the scheme of the gods, or if he's just going to destroy the Lucian line. Enhanced by the fact that regardless of which one happens, he kind of gets what he wants. But on the subject of those expected to make sacrifices, This one was heavy. I feel like I need to take a moment to apologize to Ignis for even daring to attempt to doubt what he went through. However, this episode is probably the least interesting gameplay wise in that it's the most similar to the base game. That being said, the way that the different elements are geared for different combat styles is interesting and the hookshot 
does add some fun to traversal. But this one is all about the plot. Episode Ignis shows the events in the aftermath of the Covenant with Leviathan, and particularly Ignis's rush to get Noctis out of harm. And just from a world building and context point of view, it is great to see the aftermath of something we were pulled away from at the time. But again, this is about Ignis, and not the things going on around him. I've spoken in this video of Luna's importance as Noctis's support structure, and of Prompto as an actual friend. But Ignis is kind of an amalgamation of the two. His commitment to Noctis is seen throughout the base game, but especially here. A devotion that began from childhood and has led him to run through a Niflheim invasion and then even go to the extent of taking the ultimate risk of begging the old gods for assistance to save him, something we've seen the result of should they reject you. And then, even when left blinded, and as a result, has doubts about continuing, he doesn't deviate from Noctis's desires. I feel like I should be saying more here, but that's really all the episode is about. This heartbreaking, unwavering devotion that Ignis shows. You alright? Well enough. You're resilient, I'll give you that. So, there's no doubt that these additional episodes add something to these characters and their relationships with each other. But I don't think they do it as well as another piece of media. For me, this is the best piece of supplementary media for 15. An anime released and still watchable on YouTube. It is focused on the journey the party takes from Lestalem to Cape Kaim, with the goal of leaving for Altisir. That does create a bit of confusion if you played the game first, because if you know, the journey from Lestalem to Cape Kaim without Iris in the car is the second one after having already gone back to get the ore, which does take a bit of the tension and trepidation out of the journey when it's already been done before. But that isn't the important part. We are here for the interactions. Brotherhood does a great job of exploring and enhancing the relationships between Noctis and his three compatriots, each one getting an episode dedicated to it, and it really did develop my interest and engagement with these characters. It specifically made me like Prompto a lot more. As I said, I found him to be annoying, but Brotherhood gives a much better explanation of his past than his DLC does. And it really does show his importance to Noctis. Noctis being someone who doesn't really have any actual friends or people who like him sands his position in royalty. It also shows Luna's role in this friendship existing in the first place, further highlighting her importance to him. But it's not just the relationship between these four. We see more of Gladio's relationship with Iris, and Iris's relationship with Noctis. And most importantly, 
we get more understanding of Noctis as a person. We see that while he is spoilt and lazy, he is also fundamentally a good and empathetic person, overwhelmed and isolated due to his position, as well as other small insights, like the development and actual explanation of the throwaway claims in the game of Noctis being a picky eater. And we also get the thing that I complained about earlier, the more negative aspects of the journey. We get views at the strain the journey was taking as well. I don't want to say too much more, since if you are genuinely interested in 15, I would recommend you watch it. It's five 20 minute videos. Two are actually shorter. And they are free on YouTube. I do wish that these were packaged with the game in some way, so that more people would have engaged with it. But what can you do? So, there we are, two playthroughs, four DLCs, a separate other game, an anime, and a movie later. And what is the result? Well, a largely enjoyable and meaningful experience. Playing Final Fantasy XV in 2023, with all the additions available, makes for a pretty damn good time. The characters get the necessary fleshing out, and you get a much more explained and involving plot. But does this redeem the game from the flaws and deficiencies that got thrown its way upon release, and that it's stigmatized with to this day? Well, no. While the Royal Edition and the DLCs go a long way to creating a holistic experience, the means by which the supplementing material was doled out and implemented really did a massive disservice to the quality of the content being delivered. If you look at the obtainment percentage for the achievements to complete the episodes, as well as the really simple achievements you are extremely likely to get just by playing the episodes, it is really pitifully small. And that's not surprising. I know we are increasingly living in a time where people are accepting of products which are only complete 6-12 to 12 months after their release, but you can't expect people to engage with something by telling them that it will be done later. By the time you will have released everything for the complete story, people will have finished the original product and quite likely have been left disappointed and not interested in playing more of it. Especially when you also tell them they're going to have to pay more for this stuff. I probably would never have played this game again if I wasn't doing these videos. And if I didn't get the Royal Edition and DLC for free with my PS Plus subscription, which I will be dropping to Essential because honestly it's not a good deal, I would have just spoken about the base game. 15 is a unique case of a game not only having exposition problems during its telling of the plot in the game, but it also has them with just having access to the exposition in the first place. The content was so poorly managed to the point that I still struggle to know 
what was in the base game, what came with the general patches, and what was added on with the Royal Edition. If you notice that I've suddenly got far more negative than I've been throughout the video, it's because it's so frustrating. 15 has so many things in place that gave it the potential to be one of the best games in the series, but the failure in execution has left it to be remembered as an unfinished mess, a failure given the time it spent in development, and I cannot think of a better example of disappointment. But this isn't the only source of my disappointment. Playing it a second time with the background of the Fabula Nova Custodis, something 15 was initially a part of, I wish it delved a bit more into it. I get that the 13 games had a controversial reception that they would have wanted to distance from, and generally they want the mainline titles to be distinct and not tied to previous, but I feel like they could have at least used one thing. For all my criticisms of the 13 games, they did very well to speak of the distorted and authoritarian rule the deities had. And importantly, it encourages you to challenge these structures. 15 rejected this. Presenting the gods and the old kings and what they decided to be true and correct. But frustratingly, it was there to be exploited. There are many things that the deities do that you can be critical of. The punishment of Arden for something that they bestowed on him. The decision to allow darkness to first grow and cause thousands to suffer before it can be destroyed. Stealing Ignis's eyesight because he asked for their assistance in defending the chosen king they wanted to win. It was ripe for a fabula-like commentary on how unjust these structures are. But we were led away from that. Leaving the game confused, not just in the provision of its content, but in what it was trying to say. And I feel like that makes Final Fantasy XV a great symbol for the company developing it at the time. The Crystallis series illustrated a company unable to focus. The goal to create this massive universe with the core aim of examining the concept of fate and free will was admirable and interesting. But it got out of control. More and more was added to create this ever-growing bloat, which kept revising itself. When Hajime Tabata took over as director after six years of development, only 25% of the project was done. Not too surprising, given that after four years of its development, they hadn't even finished the game that was to be responsible for launching the universe it was going to be in. I've spoken before about my dislike of creating works to serve as a launch pad for further content. I have no issue with continuing on with threads from an already successful and contained product. But when you go in with the goal of making a plethora of media before you've even laid the groundwork, by releasing at least one successful piece to showcase it, you're putting yourself into a risky position. And I feel like my view has been vindicated here. Versus 13 was announced alongside 13 and Type 0 in 2006. That's three games announced for a world that people were just being introduced to. And so it's not surprising 
that something went wrong. Fifteen started its existence as part of a launch pad for the new look of Final Fantasy. New combat, new aesthetics, and a new means of storytelling. But it came out with its plot stripped and reverted to one which you might have found on the NES. And it's just such a shame that a game primed to be a series landmark did get that honour, but for the wrong reasons. Well, that was a long one, and if you made it through the whole thing, thanks. If you happen to also enjoy, please be so kind as to do the like and subscribe thing. I highly doubt that the next video will be a JRPG, given the effort for this one, but I am currently playing a Final Fantasy I've never played before, so we'll see.